This is Reza Aslan for Aslan Media, and we are continuing our series of discussions and conversations with interesting people around the world. Today we're talking with Jonathan Ben Artsy. Jonathan is a PhD student in mathematics at Brown University. He is an Israeli uh, whose family has been in the region for many, many generations. He's recently made a splash by writing a couple of pieces here and there, including one in the Christian Science Monitor, uh, really criticizing Israeli treatment of Palestinians, both in the occupied territories and in Israel proper. And part of the reason why he's been getting so much attention for his views is that not only is he a smart and capable person uh, with some interesting views of his own, but he is also nephew to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today at Aslan Media. Mm -hmm. Listen, uh, we want to we want to start and just ask a little bit about you and who you are. You were born in Israel, correct, and you spent most of your life there. Uh, like most Israeli citizens, you were compelled to do military service, but you chose not to. Well, tell us about what that what that was like and what happened. Yeah. So, um, as you said, I was born there, um, as were my parents, and actually. Eight generations, nine generations. I'm a ninth generation uh, Palestinian, you know, could say. Um, the term Israel is a rather new term uh, as a country. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so as any Israeli, when uh, you reach the age of 18, you're com you have compulsory military service, which uh, I was uh, faced with. And after Actually, not so much uh, thought. Uh, I uh, decided that um, I'm not going to join the military because of um, two main reasons, which are equally important in my view. One is pacifism, which is kind of uh, transcends borders. It's not just because I'm Israeli and there's an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, it's it's something that's kind of more general, kind of a more philosophical point of view. Um, uh, against violence, but also at the same time, um, I could not uh, take part in specifically what Israel does um, in all occupied territories, both Palestinian and Syrian, uh, which uh, Israel also holds uh, some of their territories. Um, so for both of these reasons, I refused to, uh, to serve in the military. Now you applied for a conscientious objector status, but you didn't get it, right? And what happened? Yeah, conscientious, uh, well, yeah, um, so how should one put this? Um, there are many commitments that any country is obliged to um, by being a member of the UN and different um, world organizations. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, providing conscientious objector status or, or recognizing the conscience of its uh, citizens. So formally Israel does that uh, as well. Um, as many countries uh, uh, do, some of them more, some of them less respectable. Um, but so in Israel, uh, this formal recognition exists. However, in practice, basically no one is recognized as a conscientious objector. Always there are different uh, reasons for denying this status. Um, so the same happened for me, only that I kind of um, insisted on this, and uh, so there were became kind of a legal issue mm. and went in and out of court, including the Israeli Supreme Court. Um, and so by that alone, it kind of made headlines and uh, uh, a few years ago. And now, and isn't it, in the end, I served a total of, of a year and a half in prison. Yeah, you, so you, so, so you, they, you, you uh, spent yeah, a year and a half in prison, you said? Yes, yes, a year and a half in prison after uh, Quite a long legal battle, actually, a legal battle of about two years. Um, but uh, the Israeli mechanism uh, always works aligned. So the courts work with the military, that works with the states to kind of fool the world about uh, this uh, reality of, uh, of uh, conscientious objection status. And that's just one aspect of many aspects. So maybe. Later on, we can talk about these other aspects where Israel manages to fool uh, people around the world. Well, let's. I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. So you've been since since arriving in the United States, and of course, even before then, you've been very vocal about your criticism of Israeli policy 
towards the Palestinians and in particular of the policy at the hands of the current Prime Minister. Um, what is your view about uh, is Israeli treatment of Palestinians under the, uh, in the occupied territories? Well, so first of all, let's put this in context. I'm speaking as an Israeli citizen. I don't think that um, there's any difference under the current Israeli administration versus previous ones. So this has been a continuous um, maltreatment, to say the least, that's been going on for, for decades. Um, and yes, so I'm speaking as an Israeli, I'm not an American. Um, of course, there's a lot to say about American involvement in this, um, but and I can speak of that, but I'll leave that mostly to Americans to speak about. Um, as an Israeli, um, I, I, um, I'm, there's no way for me to ignore what uh, Israel has been doing for all these years and denying rights for millions of people, people and um, um, subjecting them to you know to random um, lockdowns or. Um, not letting them, you know, drive from one city to the next. I mean, imagine living, you know, wherever in the world anyone who's watching this living, and you need to go to the next town to, you know, buy something at the hardware store, or go to the other town on the other side to, you know, go to some, you know, your doctor for a scheduled appointment, and you're either completely blocked, or if it's a good day, then it only takes you seven hours to make it those uh, 10 miles. Um, so and, and this has been going on for many many years now. So this is something that that we can't uh, I can't sit you know on the sidelines and let let that happen. Would you go so far as to call the situation a kind of apartheid? You've written that there is some similarities between what's happening in Israel and what happened in South Africa. Would you use that term? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's a very clear definition of what apartheid is. So apartheid, that's, uh, apartheid is not a word that was used only to define uh, what was going on in South Africa. Apartheid, uh, the definition, roughly speaking, is when one people uh, subjects another people to discriminatory uh, policies. Um, and that's precisely what's going on. Um, I mean, there's uh, shades of, of gray here. There are different types of discrimination, and there's different people subjected to different types of discrimination living in different areas of the region, um, but by and large, uh, there are very big uh, swaths of, of the Palestinian population which are subjected to very uh, brutal uh, forms of discrimination, and, and according to that definition of the UN, um, that is apartheid. But, but I, I, at the same time, I, I, I don't like using these fancy words. I always uh, kind of try to refrain from using um, fancy words or characterizing something as apartheid or not apartheid because then people, you know, make that the point. That's not yeah, the becomes point. a distraction. The situation. Exactly. The point is the situation on the ground, not the words you use to describe it. So you can use whatever word you want to describe it. The situation on the ground is unbearable.